He goes by T-Rev, so we'll call him that as well, and he joins us now. Thank you very much uh, for coming with your uh, splendid YOLO hat on. You only live once. I count my blessings for the days when I was down and losing faith. They made me patient. All I can say is thank you. I really wouldn't be the same if I ain't gone through all the pain. Look what it made me. All I can say is thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to talk about the Moscow, Idaho killings. Now, there is a lot going on in the case. New documents just dropped. Make sure you go to the Idaho website and check out the docs. I will have that down in the description below for everybody to go check out. But let's jump into the timeline of the killings and what is going on in the case because some people seem to be confused about the timeline and I want to give a summary of that. And we're going to talk about the case a little bit here in this small docu-series. Now, the killings of four University of Idaho students in an off-campus home in Moscow, Idaho were as brutal as they were perplexing. It was very brutal. The group of friends had gone out in the college town and returned to their shared home late. The next day, police found the four students slaughtered inside and there were no signs of forced entry or damage. The slayings led weeks of investigation from police, frustrations from the victims' families about the pace of the police work and the fear in the local community of a mass killer on the loose. I mean, we know the the families were outraged. We seen Steve Gonsalves and we stand by Steve Gonsalves as well as we do all the victims. And I appreciate what Steve has done in this case and what his family has done. And there's a few things that I want to touch on because Christy was on a channel and it's called Chronicles of Olivia. And she said specifically that food truck footage solidified the timeline for her because at 156, she saw Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves, her daughter, get home on rain cam at 156. What rain cam video? I don't know, but that's what she said in the video on Chronicles of Olivia. Make sure you go check that out. But it goes. Nearly two months later, Moscow police arrested a 28-year-old man in Pennsylvania on a murder warrant in the killings of the four students. The man's name, Brian Christopher Kohlberger. He lived in Pullman, Washington and was a graduate student studying criminal justice. Now, we know that he sat in court and was silent and the judge entered his plea for not guilty. Now, the defense is battling back and forth with the prosecution right now, but I wanna focus on this timeline. So on Saturday, November 12th, Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal were students at the University of Idaho who lived at a nearby off-campus residence in Moscow, Idaho, a college town of about 25,000 people. They had two other roommates in their three-floor, six-bedroom apartment. Gonsalves posted a series of photos on her Instagram at some point with the caption that read, one lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. One of the photos shows Mogan sitting on Gonsalves as shoulders with Chapin and Kernodal standing next to them. That night, Chapin and Kernodal went to a party on campus and Mogan and Gonsalves went to a downtown bar called The Corner Club. Now we're jumping into Sunday, November 13th. Mogan and Gonsalves ordered at a late night food truck at about 1.41 a.m. The food truck's live Twitch stream shows they ordered $10 worth of carbonara from the grub truckers and waited for about 10 minutes for their food. As as they waited, they could be seen chatting with each other and with other people, and Gonsalves and Mogan used a private party for a ride home at about 1.56 a.m., but we do know that they arrived home at 1.56 a.m. One of the surviving roommates identified in court paperwork as DM told investigators she heard crying in the house the morning of the murders and heard a voice say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. She then saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her, the affidavit said. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase, court documents reveal. The male walked towards the backsliding glass door. DM locked herself in the room after seeing the male. The document says adding the roommate did not recognize the male. 
statements by the surviving witness and other evidence leads investigators to believe that the homicides occurred between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m., according to court documents. The two roommates at the home who were not injured woke up later in the morning and summoned friends to the home because they believed one of the victims had passed out and was not waking up. A call to 911 was made just before noon about an unconscious person at the residence, police said. Now, I don't know if that's what sparked the rumors about Ethan being found in the hallway. Is that where Ethan was? They thought he was passed out and maybe they made a the 911 call then. I don't know. That's just me speculating, but let's get back into the timeline. Arriving officers found the door on the residence open and discovered the bodies of four fatally stabbed students. It was a pretty traumatic scene to find four dead college students in a residence late Tall County coroner Kathy Mabutt later told a CNN affiliate. There was no sign of forced entry or damage, police say. Phone records indicate Koberger's phone was near the quadruple murder scene between 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 a.m., hours after Koberger allegedly killed the university students, court documents say. Moscow police issued a statement saying four people were found dead in an off-campus home by the University of Idaho. Moscow police issued a statement identifying the four homicide victims as Chapin, Gonsalves, Kernodal, and Mogan. Police said details were limited and no one was in custody. They added Moscow police did not believe there is an ongoing community risk based on information gathered during the preliminary investigation. Now, I do have questions about that myself and I know a lot of us do. What is going on with telling the community there's no ongoing threat? I have no idea put your thoughts down in the comments below let me know what you think about that moscow mayor art bedge released a statement calling the deaths senseless acts of violence bedge said only limited information could be shared without jeopardizing the integrity of the investigation green issued a statement offering condolences to the victims families in the community moscow police do not believe there is an ongoing community risk based on information gathered during the preliminary investigation however we ask our employees to be empathetic, flexible, and to work with our students who desire to return home to spend time with their families, he said. So Tuesday, November 15th, Moscow police issued a statement saying an edged weapon such as a knife was used in the killings, no suspects were in custody, and no murder weapon had been found, police said. Also based on information from the preliminary investigation, investigators believe this was an isolated targeted attack and there is no imminent threat to the community at large, police said. Later in the day, police released another statement attempting to calm fears of a killer on the loose. We hear you. We understand your fears. We determined early in the investigation that we do not believe there is an ongoing threat for community members. Evidence indicates that this was a targeted attack. Now, what that is, I would love to know. Wednesday, November 16th. Police Chief Fry held a news conference, the department's first in the case, and reiterated there was no suspect. He also backtracked on the assurances of no one at risk. We cannot say there's no threat to the community, Fry said. As we have stated, police stay vigilant, report any suspicious activity, and be aware of your surroundings at all times. Two other roommates were home at the time of the attack and were not injured, Fry said. There was other people home at the time, but we're not just focused focusing on them. We're focusing on everybody that may be coming and going from that residence, he said. Friday, November 18th, five days after the murders, Koberger received a new license plate for his white Hyundai Elantra court documents revealed. The Washington State Department of Licensing provided CNN a redacted copy of a vehicle record which included a license plate number matching what is described as the new license plate in the court documents. Detectives by then had conducted 38 interviews with people who may have information about the killings and had taken the contents of three dumpsters near the house in the case they held evidence. Investigators also asked local businesses if there has been any recent purchases of a fixed blade knife according to the police update. Open for tips from the community, investigators released a map in the timeline of victims' movements. The map shows the four students spent most of the night separated in pairs. The victims were likely asleep before they were attacked, police said. The victims were found on the second and third floor of their home, Idaho police spokesman Aaron Snell told CNN. 
Mo but the coroner told CNN she saw lots of blood on the wall when she arrived at the scene. She confirmed there was multiple stab wounds on each victim, likely from the same weapon, but would not disclose how many stab wounds nor where most were located. Sunday, November 20th, one week after the bodies of the four students were discovered, authorities still had no suspect or weapon. Moscow police captain Roger Lehner said police had fielded 646 tips and conducted more than 90 interviews. Police Chief Fry said at a news conference, Fry declined to identify who placed the 911 call from the home where the students were slain, saying only the call came from the phone of one of the surviving roommates. He wouldn't confirm which one placed the call. There were other friends that had arrived at the location, Fry said, adding the person who called 911 is not a suspect. Tuesday, November 22nd, Moscow police said they looked extensively into information suggesting Gonsalves had a stalker, but they have not been able to verify or identify one. Friday, November 29th, a Washington State University officer located a 2015 Hyundai Elantra registered to Koberger in an apartment complex parking lot, and officials were able to zero in on Koberger because his driver's license information and photograph were consistent with the roommate's description. Now that's on November 29th. Note that, ladies and gentlemen. Wednesday, November 30th, Moscow police release a list of people who they believe are not involved in the crime, including the two surviving roommates, a man in the grub truck surveillance video known as Jack Showalter, the private party driver who took Gonsalves and Mogan home, the man Gonsalves and Mogan Logan called numerous times the night they were killed and any person at the home when 911 was called. A series of comments from law enforcement officials added further confusion to the investigation, Thompson said. The Latah County prosecutor said at least one of the victims was undoubtedly targeted in the attack. Soon after, Moscow police said they spoke with Thompson and affirmed his comments were a miscommunication. Detectives do not currently know if the resident or occupants were specifically targeted but continue to investigate police said, appearing to backtrack on their earlier statements. So it's important that you note that, ladies and gentlemen. Write that down. We want to know deep about this case and when things were said. Monday, December 5th, regarding Gonsalves possibly having a stalker, police said investigators identified an incident in October which two men were seen at a business and one man appeared to follow Gonsalves inside as she exited to her car. The man did not make contact with her. Investigators contacted both men and learned they were trying to meet women at this business, detective said. They believed this was an isolated incident and not a pattern of stalking and said there was no evidence to suggest the men were involved in the killings. Wednesday, December 7th, investigators said they are interested in speaking with the occupant or occupants of a white 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra spotted near the crime scene around the time of the killings. Investigators believe the occupant or occupants of this vehicle may have have critical information to share regarding this case. The police statement said noting it had an unknown license plate. In addition, Moscow police began returning some of the personal belongings of the four victims to their families. It's time for us to give those things back that really mean something to those families and hopefully to help with some of their healing, Police Chief Fry said in a brief video statement. I'm a dad. I understand the meaning behind some of those things, Fry said. The items being removed are no longer needed for the investigation. Friday, December 9th, Moscow police said they have received an overwhelming number of tips related to their search for a white sedan seen near the crime scene around the time of the killing. Investigators were working through more than 6,000 tips they have received over the course of the investigation, Idaho State Police spokesperson Aaron Snell told other sources. Due to the number of tips received, calls were being directed to an FBI call center to help sort leads received police said. Monday, December 12th, Moscow police explained why they have not released more details about the case. We are still 100% committed to solving this crime, Moscow police Captain Lanier said in a video update on the investigation. We're not releasing specific details because we do not want to compromise this investigation. It's what we must do. We owe that to the families. We owe that to the victim, 
victims, we want more than just an arrest, we want a conviction, Langer said. Langer's remarks came as hundreds of University of Idaho students were taking final exams the week before the fall semester ends. Our analysts have spent hours sorting through and trying to come up with the most relevant tips first for the investigators to follow up on. They have interviewed some of the folks we have interviewed earlier in this investigation to clarify information, Langer said. Thursday, December 15th, Christy Gonsalves, the mother of 21-year-old victim Kaylee Gonsalves, expressed frustration over the police communications on the status of the investigation into the killings in an interview aired on NBC's Today Show. It's sleepless nights. It's feeling sick to your stomach. It's just being left in the dark, Gonsalves said in the interview. Gonsalves also recounted the day she learned something had happened to her daughter. We're running around for hours just not knowing what's going on and what happened, she said. We found out by people calling us and the sheriff showed up about three hours later. Gonsalves described learning about the police interest in a white Hyundai sedan around the time of the murders not from investigators, but from reading about it in a news release sent to her by someone else. My first thought just started being like, how long have they had this information? Where did they get this information? Was it on camera? Gonsalves said. Tuesday, December 27, trash recovered from the Koberger family residence by Pennsylvania law enforcement and sent to the Idaho State Lab for DNA testing was used to help investigators narrow down Brian Koberger as the suspect in the Idaho murders according to court documents released on January 5th. The next day, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash matched a tan leather knife sheath found laying on the bed of one of the victims according to the documents. On December 28, 2022, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath identified a male as not being excluded as the biological father of suspect profile, the document says. At least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. Thursday, December 29th, police say they have received about 20,000 tips through more than 9,025 emails, 4,575 phone calls, and 6,050 digital media submissions while having conducted over 300 interviews in the case of the four students slain in an off-campus home. The home where the killings took place will be cleaned up but remain an active crime scene under police control, authorities said. Moscow police said they have worked with a property management services company to remove potential biohazards and other harmful substances used to collect evidence, the update said. The home will be turned over to the property management company. Friday, December 30th, Koberger, a 28-year-old graduate student at Washington State University, was arrested for the killings in his home state of Pennsylvania, Authority said. He was charged in a criminal complaint with four counts of murder in the first degree and felony burglary. He resides in Pullman, Washington, about nine miles from the site of the crime and was a graduate student in the university's criminal justice program. Koberger is the owner of a white Hyundai Elantra seen in the area of the killings around the times of the murders. His DNA was also matched to genetic material recovered at an off-campus house where the killings took place, sources told the media outlets. Fry said police will aim to prove as much information they can about the extradition to Idaho in the criminal process, but due to Idaho state law, they are limited in the information they can share until the suspect has his initial appearance in an Idaho court. Tuesday, January 3rd, in an extradition hearing in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, Koberger agreed to be extradited to Idaho. The judge ordered that he be handed over to the custody of the Latal County District Attorney's Office in Idaho within 10 days. Thursday, January 5th, Koberger made an initial appearance in the Latal County Courthouse in Moscow, Idaho on January 5th. Koberger smiled at his public defender when he walked into the courtroom and did not appear to make eye contact with anyone else throughout the whole entire proceeding, including family members of victims who were crying in the first row. Steve Gonsalves, whose daughter Kaylee Gonsalves was one of the murdered victims, was with his wife and other relatives in the front row, reported by 
several media outlets, adding family members were seen staring at Koberger throughout the hearing. A no-contact order for the murdered victims, family members, and the surviving roommates for two years were requested by the prosecutor and uphold by the judge. After Koberger's court-appointed attorney, Ann Cher Taylor, requested a review of bail and Prosecutor Bill Thompson argued no bail should be upheld, the magistrate judge presiding over the case upheld no bail for the alleged murderer. Thursday, March 2nd, court documents unsealed in Monroe County, Pennsylvania revealed a cache of items seized from Koberger's Koberger's parents' home shortly after he was arrested. The items included medical style gloves, a silver flashlight, a black sweatshirt, black socks, and a pair of size 13 Nike shoes. An evidence log also revealed investigators took knives, a cell phone, black gloves, black masks, laptops, dark colored clothes, and dark shoes, brown boots, and a pair of New Balance shoes. The knives included a Smith & Wesson pocket knife and a knife in a leather sheath. Criminology books, including one title, Criminology Psychology, and notebooks also were seized, along with a shop vac and personal documents that show logs. Wednesday, May 17th, a grand jury indicted Koberger on murder and burglary charges. If found guilty, he could face the death penalty, which we know he's facing the death penalty now, but I wanted to go through the full timeline. There is the full timeline. Let me know your thoughts, comments, build the conversation up in the comments. I appreciate you guys being here. I love you, Ref Gang family. I will see you guys at the next live. I do have to go visit my grandmother and say goodbye, but I will see you at the next live. Love you. He goes by T Rev, so we'll call him that as well. And he joins us now. Yeah. I love the fam and they love me back And that's why I always have the best I give a voice to those people who were never given a chance For them slimy cats When you come here, you ain't a number to me I really take time to read what I see Don't forget to lock your doors Cause that's danger all up in these streets Y'all really put life into the air that I breathe I really am thankful for all of my peeps You're